Okay, so last time we talked about a bunch of different data types, right? We talked about strings, characters, various numerics, double, single, you int eight, and more, as well as complex numbers and booleans or logicals. Now, what we're going to cover is symbolics. So symbolics, their function is basically to allow you to construct equations in MATLAB. So with a symbolic, if I wanted to represent, like, let's say we have the equation of an object falling through the air, right? So uh, say y is y not plus v times t plus one half times a times t squared. That's our equation. So now in MATLAB, so far we've been able to store numbers, we've been able to store variables. So I'd be able to, for example, define y naught as a variable, v as something, t as something, and a as something. And then I could run this and get out a y right? But if I want to store the equation itself, I'll have to use symbolics. So with symbolics, there's two ways of creating symbolics. There's sim. And let's go over to MATLAB real quick for this. So with sim, the way it works is I can type in sim and then type in a character or string and when I run this, it will create ants and it's a symbolic class, uh, one by one symbolic. So this is creating, it's just writing it to the variable. So I could say X equals sim of X. And if I did this, now X would be the symbolic. And now if I were to say y is 2 times x, or in this, y is 2 times x, and y is a symbolic as well, just incorporating that x from before. So I could also just replace here y is 2 times sim of x, right? That does the exact same thing. Or I could say this is a, and if I did a here, it would again be y equals 2 times x. Let's create a cell or section here. Let's use C. And from last time, I'll do close all as well. So when I run this, uh, y is 2 times x. So I'm able to just store this in any variable. I didn't have to name it x or anything like that and use it later. But uh, this is sort of unnecessary, uh, doing x equals sim of x. The reason being, they made a simpler way. If you're just trying to create a variable um, in a symbolic form, so basically just x equals symbolic of x, or y equals symbolic of y, or y2 is symbolic of y2, whatever, whatever you want your symbolic to be, because your symbolic can be basically anything a variable can be named in MATLAB. So this is variable one. Let's say this. And this, uh, it takes it just fine. Y2 is, this is variable one. Um, and it will work just as if X was here. Uh, it just has it as another variable name instead of X. So you can create all sorts of symbolics like this, but let's again look at the case. You want the symbolic A, A equals sim of A. Well, the next way we can create symbolics is if we do sims, and then you just type in A, that will do the equivalent of A equals sim of A. So just whatever I type here, it'll put it here, the variable name and the symbolic in here. So if I said a2, 
I would just replace a2, a2. And then this would, these two would do the exact same thing. So this is no longer necessary. That is a really only useful if you didn't want, like if you have an X in your program, but you want, let, let's say X is one. Um, so you didn't want to say X equals sim of X to say Y equals two times X. Instead, you just Y equals two times sim of X. And now X can stay one because you didn't override it with sim or sims, uh, but you have an X in the equation Y. So when I run this, you can see I'll keep the value of X, um, but I'll have an A2 that is a symbolic. So if I had an A2, it goes one here, where I use sim to generate this X, but I use sims to generate this A2. When I run this, A2 will be a symbolic and X will be one. And then y will be the two times x. So that's uh, that's why you'd use sim versus sims if you didn't want to replace a variable like x with a symbolic x, but wanted to use symbolic x. Uh, but with sims, you can include tons of oops, I don't uh, don't do a comma there. So a two bar two x a2 var 2x, x11, whatever. So now I will override x, it'll be a symbolic, and it will create a2, that's a symbolic for just a2, uh, var2, symbolic for just var2, x, x, and x11, x11. And then now I could say equation one, and say it's a functional, all these, it's a2, times 11 plus var two divided by x minus x 11 to the power of var two. So you can see just like normal computation with symbolics, you can use standard calculations. So like multiply, add, minus, parentheses, power. Those are all options in symbolics, uh, but you don't have to worry about like dot multiply for element by element because in symbolic, it's not dealing with matrices, it's just dealing with a character here. So that's creating an equation from a bunch of variables. And again, that's the same as doing sim of a two plus sim of var two and so on. Uh, but as you may suppose it's much faster just to do sims a2 and then you can reference a2 later if you don't need to have this x not written over from before so that's how you create symbolics oh and real quick here you can see um, x is not a symbolic right so when i do x it just replaces it in with one so you can use variables in symbolics and it will just replace them with their value the only reason it does this as a symbolic is because there's a symbolic in it. So when there's a symbolics you're dealing with uh, in combining different data types, it goes with symbolic and it just takes the value of that double or whatever numerical value and substitutes that into your symbolic variable. So what can we do with these exactly? What's the utility? Well, one thing is Let's say you have an equation uh, and let's just say like from before we have, let's say location is location not plus velocity times T plus one half times A times T squared. So this is an equation. If I created Sims look zero, B T A. I can run this and it'll say location is location zero plus V times T plus A times T squared over two. So if I then wanted to actually use this equation, like I wanted to plug in something here, uh, I'm able to construct the equation with symbolics. And then let's say I want to just replace this A with 
negative 9.81. I can say subs. And then I can say location Excel neg 9.81 or can't do point. So I'll just do this. So this is the location for an acceleration of negative 9.81. I can subs into loc, which is the symbolic variable housing that computation. And I can subs in to a negative 9.81. And when I run this, you can see it does the same thing. It keeps uh, loc Excel neg 9.81 is again, it's symbolic, but it now just put into the computation the value 981 or 9.81 for the A. Uh, and the reason I was able to just put A here is because I defined it up here. So in my variable, it's just replacing the variable A with the value A, which is sim of A. So you gotta pay attention. If you did sims, you could just replace a if you did not then you would need to do sim of a Let's show you that real quick when i run it it does the exact same thing so both are totally valid ways of using subs and subs is just short for substitute if you hadn't guessed um but subs subs lets us start with an equation and then fill in some stuff along the way but let's say let's say i want something a little more complicated so i want the location for excel Oops. and i want to substitute in several values for a so negative 9.81 negative 32.2 uh let's say negative 1000 then I'm able to do that and it will create a matrix from loc into loc Excel that has each of these substituted in for A. So that way you can substitute multiple things in and still have an equation that has some box in it, um, but deal with multiple values. So that's an option there. You can also, if you have I go back to A and A here, just for simplicity's sake. You can replace multiple things. So if I wanted to replace all of these, A, V, T, and loc zero, I can have my second matrix here. Instead of giving a set of values for A, for example, I can give it a value for A, V, T, and loc zero. So A negative 9.81, V, let's say uh, 100, T is 10, and milk zero is zero. So now when I run this, I get still a symbolic book Excel, but it's a numerical value, right? Because I plugged in all the symbol, all the symbols were replaced by numerical values so it just is computing out what this result is so then if i wanted to get that as an actual number so i want it as a double instead of a symbolic i can do double of ants or uh not ants because it's stored in loc cell and now i get that number in a double format so then i could actually use this and plot it or anything like that. Whatever I want to do with this number, I could save it to the workspace for somebody else to use whatever I want to do with it. So that's how you can do that. And the way this works in MATLAB, if I did loc Excel equals double of loc Excel so that I updated loc Excel to be this instead. So I take the initial loc Excel, make it a double, and then that's the new loc Excel. What this is really doing is it substitutes into this symbolic variable 
all of these numerical values and then keeps it a symbolic and then I change it to a double. So what I'm able to do with this is really I can just say what I've got here, look Excel is this, right? So if I were to just copy this and replace look Excel right here, then I can get rid of this initial look Excel, just do it in one line, and then it takes the double, and as an input, it takes the same thing as before, because it's just not saved to a variable, but it's still computing it. It's called nesting when you place one in the other. So I'll just use spaces to clarify here, so it's visually more intuitive. But if I use substitute with loc, and then out of this I'll get my symbolic, I can then plug that in as the input to double, and then I can save it all so that I don't have to do loc excel is one thing, and then loc excel is double of loc excel. I can just take the double of the output of this, and then that's what actually goes into loc excel. So when I run this, it's just like that. And you can do this in all sorts of things. You can nest things in because all a function is doing is as output variable name for output is function name parentheses input one, input two, input three. So in this case, I've got three inputs, but then I can use this variable variable name for output for this output as another input. And so hence I'm nesting my things. Now I could multiply this by two. And this is not valid because there's no function name function name. But if I were to multiply this by two, I can use nesting, be this, the output of this function subs into the input of double and then multiply all that by two. Or I could do inside here, multiply this by two, and now the velocity is twice what it is, and it will compute everything with that. I could multiply this by two. It, it's really important to keep in mind these parentheses because just as three plus 11 times 12 does not equal three plus 11 times 12, right? It's 168 versus 135 where you're feeding in inputs and stuff to equations is really key. So practice around with that a little bit and make sure it's making sense to you and it becomes a little bit more intuitive what nesting functions and how to actually structure things together so that it works as you're trying to get it to work. For example, uh, we look one more time. If I were to try and do, if I run this, so let's say I want something that goes from, if I wanted to create a matrix that goes from 4076 to 5000, I can use that, right? The colon, and then if I did two in between, it'll go in steps of two, but it'll go from 4076 to, to 5000. If I did that here, it will be able to do the exact same thing. You can just replace this with it actually computing, and then it's colon operator with the 5,000, and so it creates its own matrix. If I go up here, you'll see this is loc Excel is this matrix. So that's another example of using inputs, like nesting them together to get more complicated outputs. Now, uh, one other thing that symbolics are useful for is if I were to create, we, we know the equation of the ideal gas law. So PV equals NRT, right? That's the ideal gas law. If I wanted to have this equation exist in MATLAB, what I could do is I could say equation equals and then I'll use symbolic, so P, V, N, R, T, and equation equals P times V, and that equals N times R, and I'll match the case, N times R times T. But the equals, so this equals here in math just makes it equivalent, right? But it equals in 
MATLAB is saying whatever's to the right of the equal, replace the value of this variable with that value. So what if I had two equals here? What what is this gonna do? Well, what will happen is it won't like it because it'll say incorrect use of equal because on this computation it's not saying that p times v equals n times r times t and then that equals equation or whatever. You can only have one equal. Um, so I could have like equation equals p times v. That would be totally valid, but that's not what I want. I want it to actually house an equation and equality with p times v equals n times r times t. And the way you tell MATLAB that it's an equality is you use a double equal because equal is used to set the value of variables, equalities, and equations in symbolics use a double equal. So if I run this, it'll be p times v equals equals r times t times n, and it'll just reorganize it. Uh, the reason it did that is because it goes in alph alphabetical order, so it works its own way of organizing the variables there. But so now I have an equation and the advantage of doing that over, over just storing like a value equals some function of variables. Like I could just, if I wanted to solve for P, I could do P equals instead of doing Sims right here, I could do P equals N times R times T divided by V, right? That would be a perfectly, Uh, that would be a perfectly valid p but in the case that i'm just working with an equation and i want to be able to do multiple things for example i want to be able to solve equation solved for n what i can do here is i can use the function solve and feeding equation and n now if i run this it will solve equation for n. So this makes it really simple. It, MATLAB does, I, I'm perfectly capable of saying n equals p times v divided by r divided by t or divided by r times t. I'm perfectly able to do that, but what's the point of a programming language without using all of the speed hacks? So I'm able to use solve and create equations and have MATLAB solve the equations for me. So really simple. That's a very nice feature of Symbolox, the main reason I use that. So then you can use equation solve for n, and then you can subs into equation solve for n, and then plug in for P, V, R, T. The first one here is P. So let's say I want 1,000 in for P. Second is V. So let's say 100 in for V. Uh, R, let's say 100,000 and T, 1. So if I run this, my answer will be 1. But again, it will be a symbolic. So if I wanted this to be a number then i would take double of that and now i get answers one and it's a double so that works pretty well it lets us do solving substitutions so that's how we can use some blocks you can use the double equal to create qualities if i did less than equal it will also understand uh, let me comment these out. And here you can see P times V is less than or equal to R times C times N. So we're able to use inequalities as well in Symbolox. So that's this other data type. We have Sim, we have Sims, we have Subs, and we have Solve as the main things to keep in mind with this symbolic. Now we are going to go into a couple of more built-in functions. So statistics. statistics. 
I want, let's say I have a bunch of data. I have and statistics. Let's say I have grades from a bunch of students. And I have 100 for the first, 99, 87. And I don't want to have to write all these in. So I'm going to use a random matrix, which creates a matrix with however many rows here and however many columns here. So let's say I want 100 students and random produces between 0 and 1. So I want the grades between 0 and 100. So most likely that way I have 100. Now I have grades randomly generated between 0 and 100 with 100 columns. And to sort of verify this, I can use plot that we had talked about last time and feed in grades. So if I feed in just one matrix, it will just plot X is the indices or the positions in this matrix. So for I clear this and then look at just grades, then I'll see 81 is in column one. So it will be plotting X as one, Y as 81. Then this is in column two. So X value of two, X value of three, four, five, so on all the way to X of 100, right? So when I plot this, I can see, okay, it's between zero and 100 and 100 points here. So this is what I'm looking for, grades randomly generated between 0 and 100 for some students. So let's do some statistical stuff with this. Let's say I wanted to find the maximum within this set. Well, what I can do is I can say max of grades. And right here, the greatest, and if I look at the plot, I can see the greatest is right here. So if I tap, it'll show me the value of x and y, and my y is 98.7982. So that's correct. That did give me the greatest value in that. So max of grades is 98.7982. Tap it again to get rid of it. So what about minimum? Maximum and minimum. Well, I can use min of grades. And when I run this, if I look at this plot, a little hard to tell, it's probably this one, but I'll look at both of these points right here. Click and click. So Y is lower here. So 1.54871 and 1.54871. So perfect. It found the minimum in our values as well. What about an average? Well, another term for average is mean, right? So mean of grades, this will give me an average. This function, when I run it, mean of grades, it will just add up all the grades and then divide by 100 because we have 100 total. So our average grade is 49.2884, which is pretty close to 50. So the grades average in this class at about the 50% point, right? What about uh, another statistical one, standard deviation? So STD of grades. A little bit of an awkward acronym there, but STD of grades. If I pull up the doc, STD. STD returns the standard deviations of the elements of A, blah, 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 and continues there, but that's what we needed to know. Returns the standard deviation of A. So standard deviation. And if I wasn't sure about mean, for example, I pull up doc. All right, just say help, whoops. Help mean. And if I scroll up, the average or mean value. So great. Now, um, let's say we were trying to find 
not what the maximum grade was, but if we look at this plot, we want to find at which point, like if it was the first student that had the maximum grade, if it was the uh, 30th, if it was the 93rd, which, which student had the highest grade? Well, if I pull up the doc for max, as we can see with the syntax, it gives us several options for what we feed in here. So the first thing we did was we just fed in one matrix. So max of A, with the matrix A and M is the maximum value, right? But if I look down here, if I scroll down a little bit more, it'll give me more information here. And M, I, equals max of returns the index in the operating dimension that corresponds to the maximum value of A for the previous syntaxes. So same as max of A before, um, it'll give me M and I. So it returns before the maximum of A, but it also returns the index into the operating dimensions that correspond to the maximum value of A for any of the previous syntaxes. So index is by 2 to 11 as a matrix. The index of here, the index for this matrix of two is one because it's the first position in the matrix. This would be the second position in the matrix, index of two, index of three, index of four, index of five. So when we're plotting, right, and we only give it one, it's plotting X is the index, but suffice it to say that the position within the matrix that we're trying to find then with grades is the index, right? So let's say I have an index and val equal to max of grades. So now I'm using the same function, but I'm using a different syntax and MATLAB is smart enough to know that I'm going with this option right here, right? which is the same as this, it's just we're not feeding as many inputs. So when I do this, MATLAB will output something different than it did initially because it knows I'm wanting two things instead. I want a matrix and I want to give it two values here. So when I run this, I'd say val is 14, index is 97.05985. So the 97.05985 is the maximum value, right? If I look at this again, not there, here, 97.0599, because it rounded. Well, oh, you'll also notice it has a different maximum right now, right? Because I ran it again, so it's got a different random plot here. So every time you run the random matrix, it'll generate a random new set of values, right? Uh, that's important to pay attention to. So index and val, uh, I was looking for the index or the position in the matrix that has the highest and the value of the highest, but this isn't, this isn't quite right because it, it's saying index equals the maximum value and val, which is the index, is 14. So I've got these backwards and it's val and index, but now when I run this, Let's do it again so it's not first value. Okay, it's the third, whatever. Uh, if I click this, 99.7003 is the maximum, and it's at a position of three. So my index here, the variable name index right here is three, and my val, I probably want to call this max val grades, something like that. So my max val grades, is 99.756 in this example and it's the 43rd student so that's how you can find the value and the position where within that grades that value is maximized so let's say we had a list of names of students so we'll kind of put everything we've been using together Let's say we had a list of names of students, and let's say the first one's John, second one's Jane, third is Spencer, fourth is Harriet. 
and fifth is carbon. Now, let's say that their grades, so these are the names, and I'm just going to store it in strings, right? Because if I stored it in characters, you remember, and shortcut for doing this, by the way, if I copy this and make a new window and press Control H, or first I paste that in there, if I put in a quotation mark for find and replace it with a apostrophe, replace all, it will replace them in just this. So instead of having to go and write those all out myself, I can copy that back here, close it, and paste it back in so that I don't have to do it for all those values. So now that I've got all of them in apostrophes, these are characters, right? So now when I say names, if I run this, oops, take away grades, if I run this, it just puts it into all one because it creates a matrix where the first is J, second is O, third, fourth, fifth. So it doesn't care that I put a comma here that I might as well have done this, right? So that's why it's important to remember to use strings in a case like this. And once again, I'll H, but swap it now. So philosophy and quotation marks. Place all, and I accidentally got an extra quote here. But when I do this, close it, don't save, paste it back in. Real quick, got them all replaced. So now the grades for these students are random one and then five in this case, because there's five of them. And if I run this, if you give me zero to one, so let's multiply by 100 again. And the max of the grades will give me the maximum. So if I plot grades again and do a close all here, don't worry about clear CLC, but close all. The first student, who is John in this case, has a score of 40, so he's the highest, or he has 40.3491. And if I run this again, now the third or uh, the fourth actually, Harriet has the highest 88.4153. So if I want to just print out easily which name it is instead of having to go, okay, the max is 88.4153. So who is that? That's the fourth person. Okay, who's the fourth? One, two, three, four. If I didn't want to have to do all that, what I can do is I can say max val and index as output for max grades and now it tells me okay index is let me clear this and run that again let's see control enter now it's the fourth as i score and i can see that with index so in this case if i just wanted to print out who has the highest score i would suppress all of these right so it doesn't Log up the command window, and I could say names of index. And where the brackets make then make the matrix, the parentheses let us call up values within it. So because it's just one row uh five columns, I'll just call up the index one. So if this were two, I'll call it the second name in here, and that will st return exactly what we want to see, right? So in reality, I'll do a CLC here. So it just shows the name. But right here, it will print out whoever has the highest score. And I can double check. If I click, it's the fourth. It was one, two, three, four. Indeed, Harriet. If I run the skin. Now it's Spencer. It was the third. And that's correct. So. That's how we can sort of use mix and mash tools to find what we want and have MATLAB figure out that sort of stuff for us. So we get rid of monotony. That's one of the things I like about programming is it allows you to eliminate a lot of the monotony. I'm going to look at two other functions here real quick. This is sort and sort rows. So these are additional functions that, as you might guess, they sort. So 
what does sort do? Well, if I pull up the doc for sort. It sorts the elements of A in ascending order. You can also specify direction, um, ascend or descend. And you can give another input such as ABS to just sort by magnitude. But in any case, the basic use of this is if I have a lot of grades and I hold on to do another plot on top, sort of grades off, and I'll do a legend here. Well, I'll do all of the important plotting elements. So I do an X label, index, Y label, grade, title, grades, grades, students, and legend, legend, grades, sorted grades. So now when I look at this, I have grades and sorted grades. And as you can see, when I sort the grades, it just goes now in ascending order. So the lowest is this, right? It goes from the fourth to the first position. The second lowest this, so it goes to the second position. This to the third, so it goes to that position. So now no matter, I run this again, no matter what organization of grades I've got here, my sorted grades will put them in increasing order of value. So, yeah, if, uh, if I look at another matrix, so let's say I have one, two, three, seven, six, five. If I sort this, what does it look like? It doesn't change it at all. The reason for this is because it's going through each column and sorting it from lowest to highest, uh, reordering the rows for each one, not the columns. So if I swap these so that it's reordered here, initially it was 716253, now it's 17265, it's 2635. So it reordered the rows so that it put the higher, lower in the column. Well, let's see. When I run this, seven, six, two, one, two, three. Does it keep the position? So it does it organize each column individually? And the answer is yes, because with seven one, it'll reorganize to one seven. With six two, it'll reorganize to two six, and two three, or my two three. So if I wanted to reorganize everything just based upon one column, for example, then instead of sort, I'll do sort rows. So again, sort does each column individually. Now with sort rows, we can tie them together. So if I wanted everything organized by, by this, so if this was tied to this number and I wanted to organize it by just this first column, then I would need sort rows instead. So if I pull up doc sort rows, sort rows of A and then column. So as you might guess, you can specify the column and you can use a vector to do this. So uh, as it says, you can sort by first the fourth column and then if there are multiple in the fourth column with the same value, then you can break uh, those up and sort them by the sixth column. So by default, it'll go with the first column. But if I wanted to this one, if I wanted to sort the rows of matrix one so that right here, the seven stays with the six and two, but I want to reorganize by this. So let's add one more row here and that's five nine three now if i do sort rows of matrix one the initial matrix one is seven one five 
So with sort rows, I want one to stay together. So I should have one, two, three above five, nine, three above seven, six, two. One, two, three, five, nine, three, seven, six, two. So exactly right. If I wanted to organize by the second column, I could do that instead with this. So now it's organizing by 629. So it'll keep, once again, the, the rows together. But it will now do this column up top, then the 6, then the 9. So 269, 123, 593, 762. So that's perfect. This is a tool like max can take out the maximum value if you want to organize the data so that it's going from lowest to highest. Then you can use sort upgrades and that'll go row by row. And if you want sort rows, so to keep the row as a piece and just reorganize by the column specifically, then you can use sort rows. And tool here is if you wanted to sort everything in matrix one, then you could use matrix one and with the colon, convert them all so that they just have the one matrix there. So it, that it's, remember if you do matrix one colon, you'll just make it all in a single column. You know, just go the elements in the first column, and then it'll add the elements in the second column, add the elements in the third column together. So with sort, it'll just take all of your values and sort them. So this is what, whoops, this is what my matrix one of colon is, but seven one five six two nine two three three. If I wanted to reorganize all of those in increasing order, then I would do this. Now let's talk about one more function real quick, and that is sum. And sum is a function to just add up all the values. So if I have a random matrix, random matrix is rand uh, 100 values, and I want to just sum all of them up, sum of random, matrix. I can run that. And ants returns. Oh, made a mistake here. This would be one 100, right? So now it's got uh, random values between zero and one and 100 of them. So we expect somewhere around 50, right? So 57, pretty close, uh, is the sum of all of the elements within random matrix. And if I had two rows, 100 columns, I'd expect something like twice that. However, when I run this now, ants is this matrix. And so instead of just adding up everything within random matrix, what it did was it added up each column. So if I look up rand, random matrix of the all the rows so colon for all the rows and one for the first column if i pull up this if i add these two together so if i did sum of that it'd be 1.185635 well if i well, the sum of random matrix, I go back to the first value here, it's the same thing in the first column. So what sum is doing, this is why you have to be careful exactly what you're feeding into what, because it's now got the two rows, it'll only add up every thing in the first column and put that into the first column in sum. So if I wanted to actually sum up all the values, and I can use something we talked about before, remember to create a single row matrix, or uh, one two three five five six, and then create it by row matrix, and then you have a single column, I can just use the colon operator, and you have colon, and it just puts the index of each of these 
puts them in an index for a column vector. So, when I do summer random matrix, if I really wanted to just add up everything in it, then I can do colon and just make it all one column vector. And then when I do this, it will now add up everything in the matrix. And that happens to be 102.3862 in this case. Okay. And let's say we have need of more built in functions. Three more we're going to learn about real quick rounding. So, as you may guess, if you had just one guess as to the name of a function to round, well, you might assume it is round. And indeed, that is the case. So, if I have random, I'll do the same thing here so we can see the random matrix. Oops. Do just a lot less. One, five, and do the random matrix here. There we go. When I do this, it will round just like you'd expect. It'll round up or down depending on if it's greater than or less than. So if I, if I try 0, 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.45, 0 0.5, 0 0.55, we could expect 0 to round down, not even needing to round because it doesn't have a decimal point. One to keep its value of 1.1 1 .1 to round down, 0.45 to round down, 0.5, we would probably expect to round up, and indeed that's what it does, and 0.55 first round up. So that's round. If you do sil, that's a, another rounding function, but sil, uh, you can think of it as the silling. That's what sil is short for. But silling is just saying random matrix. When I run this, a uh, sil will always round up. So zeros will stay at zero, but anything um, above zero will round up to the one. I get this sort of 1.55. It would be two, right? It will always round up uh, to do the opposite, to always round down. You do floor, you see it, floor of random matrix so i can do round round up round down so yeah there you go those are some rounding functions that you may find useful for a variety of reasons now let's talk about uh complex numbers a little bit more so we talked about creating complex numbers before so for example, if I add complex 1 is equal to 11 in the real and 50 in the imaginary, I could create that with this, right? Um, I could also use the function complex and feed in 11 and 50, and those will return the same thing, right? So a couple ways we can interact with complex numbers, we can do real of complex one. And what that will do is it'll return 11 because it'll return the real component of the complex number. And you may guess if I were to do imag, short for imaginary, of complex one, that'll return my 50, right? And I can say is real. This is another function and feeding complex one. If I run this, return logical of zero. And of course, as we've said, logical of zero means false. So this is a complex number. It's got some imaginary component. So it is not real. So if I had 1150, if I run this, it is real, right? So that's a little bit more dealing with complex numbers. Okay, so let's summarize really quickly. We created symbolics with sim and sims. We created an equation or an inequality. Used statistics, so maximum mean standard deviation, and was able to find where in a matrix it has the maximum value. And then I was able to 
apply this with a set of students grades that I made up. Then I was able to use sort and sort rows to organize a matrix that would better fit what I'm looking for. And then with my random matrix, I was able to sum it and then I can round, round up, round down. And I was able to extract from a complex matrix the real values and the imaginary values. And I was able to check, are there any imaginary components in my input? Uh, if there aren't, then it is real and it will return true. So. Hopefully you learned a bit and uh, understand how you can apply this. Thanks.